All right, I'd like to get your um, your Bibles out. We're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to have a bit of a uh, look at um, a fellow by the name of uh, Goliath and uh, I guess also David as well, of course. So in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at uh, all them places. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the, the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And they went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named, named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Uh, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, why are you come out uh, to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down, uh, down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and, and greatly afraid. And um, you think about perhaps what might have been going on in the mind of Goliath at, at this particular time. And here was a guy who was... Uh, you know, pretty, pretty tall, pretty big, pretty strong. Um, you know, you look up sort of what he was wearing and the and the spear that he was carrying, and they were they weren't just sort of little bits of um, metal and you know like a little arrow or anything. This was a really big uh, weapon that he was that he was carrying, and so he was a guy who was very confident no doubt, in his own ability. Um, he'd been in battles before. He'd obviously won a lot of battles um, before. He was uh, looked up to by the Philistine people, um, probably even, you know, the, uh, the, the king of the Philistines sort of looked up to this person. And Goliath trusted in his weapons. They'd, they'd worked for him uh, before, and he wasn't afraid of anybody or or anything. He was very um, self self confident. Um, in fact, he probably had a pretty good idea that people were afraid of him. Um, if uh, if Goliath walked into a room, uh, you probably got out the way and let Goliath go where he would wanted to go, and you might have just sort of. Uh, you know, uh, got gotten out of the way of this this really big, frightening looking um, person, and so everything about Goliath's life up to this point would have told him that he was going to be victorious. He was going to be um, the winner. They were going to have Israel as as their servants and uh, do with them as they um, as they would. And in, in Goliath winning this uh, battle against whoever Israel would, would, would choose here would have given him even more honour, even more prestige um, within the, the, the Philistine um, society um, there. And so everything is really in, is in his favour. And he doesn't think it matters who they choose. You choose anyone you want. Um, uh, it, it doesn't really matter because look at me. I'm gonna I'm gonna beat whoever you're gonna you're gonna put up. 
And, and so with all that in his head, there was one big problem that he hadn't thought of, that he hadn't taken into account, that he hadn't, that he hadn't reckoned for at all. And that was this time he wasn't just fighting a person. He'd fought hundreds of people, no doubt, before this, and had probably won most of them pretty easily and um, dispatched his enemies um, quickly and, uh, you know, no, no problem. But this time he was fighting the living God and he was making plans, he thought, to defeat a person but really, that's not what the battle was about at all. The battle was that he was going to be fighting um, God and God's people and God's promises. And so nothing that he'd ever done before would have prepared him for this kind of battle. He'd probably never fought before where he was at the disadvantage. Probably not one time in his life did he fight when he was at the, the the disadvantage but always was on the winning side there um he thought in his own mind that he was challenging israel but what he was really doing was he was challenging god and he was challenging god's authority and challenging god's uh challenging god's promises there now uh in verse um 10 he says i defy the armies of israel this day give me a man that we may fight together um the word the word defy there um is in the hebrew uh koraf i'm sure i've pronounced that wrongly but koraf is the is the word and um it means a lot of it means a lot of things but one of the things that it does mean is to expose and so here he is exposing, if you like, um, Israel. And he was exposing a lot of things. He was exposing their fear. He was exposing their unbelief. He was exposing their, their lack of trust. Certainly exposing their, their lack of... Uh, um, acknowledging any ability maybe even that they had had in their own strength he he really was exposing everything um, uh, about them and um, you know no doubt he would have known about the God of Israel the nations around about sort of knew about those things and in a in a way he sort of you know in a in a mocking way he's kind of scolding them for not trusting in this God that they keep going on about in his, in his mind. And so he's, he's standing there um, making all of these challenges and exposing that fear and uh, that unbelief and that, and that lack of trust perhaps that they, that they had. And, um, you know, from time to time we get, we get Goliaths that sort of come up against us and um you know hopefully we know the right way to go we, we get on we get on our knees and we we pray to the lord but you know i'm sure all of us have had the, the experience where some big big thing has sort of come against us and it it exposes us to this uh, goliath um the fears maybe that we have um the the unbelief that that we have i always think of that that guy that when jesus said uh, you know do you believe and he said uh, yes lord i believe help thou mine unbelief um and so it's an important you know lesson for us to 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 learn these things so that when that goliath appears and uh as you as you go on in life um you'll get more than one goliath no doubt that's going to just rear its um rear its ugly head whether it's a, a healing need or some kind of provision or whatever, whatever it might be you, you all know what they can be we've got to make sure that 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 event doesn't expose us 
as as it was exposing um, Israel here. Now, if you go down to verse 23, same chapter. Um, so David's sort of on the scene, scene now and he's kind of just sort of arrived where all this is happening. And in verse 23, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spoke according to the same words and, and David heard them. So he's reiterating this, uh, this challenge to, um, uh, to, to Israel there. And all, uh, verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. It's almost like the more this guy challenges them, the more fearful, you know, uh, that they, they get. Initially, they, they were greatly afraid. Now they're greatly afraid, afraid and they're running away. They're, they're fleeing sort of from the, from the scene. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? You should look at this bloke. He's like seven foot ten or something. Uh, weighs four hundred pounds. The, the spear he's the spear he's carrying weighs more than I do. Kind of thing. And so they're they're frightened of this person. Surely, to defy Israel, is he come up? And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in in Israel. So they sort of. You know, they're almost trying to goad somebody into, into sort of running out with their little spear kind of thing. Look at what the king's going to give you, all this money. Um, and they're probably thinking, well, what good's money going to be if I've got Goliath's spear inside of me? What, what, good's that going to, what good is that going to, um, uh, what good is that going to do? And so David heard exactly the same words from Goliath as he'd been saying for however long he'd been doing it, quite some time. And he he realised the issue. He knew what it was at stake, just like they did. The, the, the people that were there all this time, they, they knew what the issue was. They knew what was at stake. Uh, they knew what had to be done. They just um, weren't doing it. But the thing that was missing with David was fear. He didn't seem to have that fear. What he'd done was he'd replaced that fear with trust in God. And it's a really important lesson for us to learn as we're walking on with the Lord is to replace fear, which is, which is a natural thing to happen. You know, the, the Lord gave us the emotion of fear for, for, for good reason, so that we wouldn't, you know, perhaps get ourselves into situations where we're not going to just walk across the main road out here and see who hits us with a car. We don't do that because we're, we're fearful um, of doing that and the consequences. And so, you know, in some cases, it's a good thing, but you can't ever let it that the fear is at the expense of trust. It's very important that we don't, um, we don't do that. And so we know that the word... Uh, uh, Israel means uh, uh, ruling with God or princes with God. And David saw the reproach on Israel. The word there can also be translated as shame. And maybe they did sort of feel a little bit of shame in that they were sort of running away and, and hiding, but it, it overtook them. The fear just overtook them. Um, where they where they're at the point where they that they couldn't trust because of that that fear, um, and so he 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 knew this is this is Israel ruling with God. How, how can how can he reconcile um, that word that we're rulers with God when he sees all this fear around about him, and it was such a such a contradiction, you know, the armies of Israel. You would think that would be unbeatable. The armies of the living God versus anything. What's going to win? And yet he saw that in this case, they, they had, uh, you know, all but, all but surrendered sort of thing. Uh, in verse 30, uh, 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this 
Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man um, a man of war from his youth. And an unbelief like that and the world, it's always going to try and talk you out of trusting in the Lord and walking with the Lord. It's always going to say you're not able to and you fill in the blank. You're not able to. Um, when it comes to the things of God, it's, it's, it's not something that you're going to be able to overcome. You need to do something. You need to do something else. Don't, don't trust in God. There isn't a God, perhaps, is what most people um, think. And so he says, you're not able to do this. In verse 34, David said to Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he has defied um, the armies of, of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord, uh, the Lord be with me. Be with thee, sorry. And so David is remembering these prior victories, these, these testimonies that he sort of built up over um, his relatively short life at this, at this point. But he's remembering what the Lord had done for him before. And, and in doing that, he's, he's, he's building himself up. He's building up his, his, his confidence, not in himself, but, uh, but in the Lord. And it's why testimonies are such a, a powerful thing, because, you know, we hear a, a testimony of um, a, a miracle or whatever it might be, and um, we're built up because we think, wow, you know, the Lord is able to do that for that person. He can do this for me or some other thing that we might be praying about for someone else, maybe, maybe even, you know. Verse 38, and Saul armed David with his armour and put uh, a helmet of brass upon his head, also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword uh, upon his armour and he essayed to go. Didn't want to, he didn't want to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not proved them, and David put them from, from off him. So, you know, you might have a giant problem. <laughs> this is what they had. They had a giant problem um, with this guy. But um, we've got to always remember and appreciate that we've got an even bigger uh, solution. And Goliath was this giant of a person but David had a simple understanding that he was the head and not the tail, that he was above and, and, not, and not beneath. And that's all he needed to know. He didn't really need to sort of, you know, it's not almost like he then goes away and says, right, we're going to plan this out. We've really got to sit down with, you know, some, some of your generals perhaps, and let's figure out how I can get out there and, and, and defeat this guy. Let's have a bit of a round table. He didn't do any of that. He's just like, right, you're giving me this armour. Uh, it's no good. I haven't proved it. You know, I don't, I don't need this. I've already got armour. And it's, it's not metal and spears and all that kind of stuff. It's the promises of God. This is my, my armour um, that I have. And it's all he needed to know. And it's all, it's all we need. It's all we need to know. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to uh, be running around looking for what our weapons might be or what our, what our armour might be. We've, we've got the armour. We've got the weapons. They're already in place. Um, we just have to, you know, trust and put one foot 
one foot in front of the other sort of thing. One of the gifts that came out was that you don't have to think about what you're going to say or what you're going to do. You just go out and, and, and I'll take care of all of that. You know, you don't have to do too much planning. I'll, I'll take care of all that sort of thing. Um, he didn't seem to have much use here for a plan B. We often talk about plan B, don't we? And uh, he didn't have use for a backup plan at all. <clears throat> he had one plan, and that was, um, God's on my side, I can't possibly lose. And that was his plan. Simple as that. And we, we often try to complicate it so much. Um, and we've all done it, no doubt. Yet here was a great story where um, there wasn't any complication. It was, it was dead easy, you know. He, he's he's uh, he's seven foot tall. I'm five foot three. He weighs four hundred pounds. I weigh a hundred pounds. How can I lose? Kind of thing is what he was is what he was thinking there. Um. So in verse forty, it says he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near. Um, to the Philistine and the Philistine came on and drew near to David and the man that bare the shield went before him and when the Philistine looked about and saw David he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair uh, countenance he was an office worker kind of guy he uh, he hadn't sort of uh, uh, built up any muscles he hadn't done anything he had no experience uh, he had no track record of any kind um, he looked after sheep pretty well and that might be a really good thing to do. It's just that looking after sheep isn't all that useful when you're going to try and fight somebody who's seven foot tall. And so he had no natural uh, abilities or anything on his side um, at all. And Goliath was a little, um, well, maybe disappointed even that, uh, that they would send out a boy. Uh, in verse 43, and the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts uh, of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you, uh, whom you, have, uh, whom you have defied. And so here he is going to face this this kid david what what he didn't realize that he was no match for a, a youth armed with trust in god that's what he was really armed with we think he was armed with five stones but really what he was armed with was um a trust in uh, in the lord uh, it's interesting that um he took five stones with him and five in Bible numerics is grace, God, God's grace. And so he took God's grace with him, but he, he only needed one. He only needed the one. God himself is all he needed. Um, and he, he, he uh, slung that stone, David did, but God guided it. And so, you know, it's an important thing that we, we take that action. He took that action, you know, but he just, he just slings this thing. But God directed it to exactly where it, uh, it needed to go. And unfortunately for, um, uh, for Goliath, it was in the, in the middle of his forehead, forehead there. And so um, I might just read one verse. Um, maybe verse 50 and David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him but there was no sword in the hand of David he, he'd gone out to fight this guy and, and, and didn't bring a sword with him at all um, in fact when he, when he chops off uh, Goliath's head he had to use Goliath's sword to do it because he didn't even bring, uh, bring a sword with him and so this story in the world is, is often described as the underdog taking on the champion. Um, it's, how it sort of, it's how it sort of looked at, really. 
this this nobody, this complete underdog, taking on this incredible person, this this champion of the Philistines, and and, and they're exactly right. It's just that they've got they've got the players the wrong way around. David was the champion. Goliath was the underdog. In fact, he wasn't even as good as that. Goliath had absolutely no chance in this battle at all, none whatsoever. He was on the losing side right from the get-go because, um, because David wasn't going to trust him uh, in himself. Um, the world, of course, can think that it's Goliath, maybe, and it's standing there in front of us like a, like a giant, like this. You, so big you can't even see around the problem that's in front of you, and it threatens us, and <clears throat> it wants us to fear. And it wants us to lack faith. And it wants us to run away and hide like, like they did. That they just, you know, yeah. fleed away from, from, from the problem. But we've got to make sure that we're, we did things that David did. You know, we've already got the armor. We've already got the, um, the, the, the weaponry. You know, we've got the grace of God. The five stones, we've got the grace of God on our, on our side. And all we need, though, is God himself. The, the one stone that's going to that's going to do um, do the job. It's interesting too that as you read this story, that um, David he doesn't get really close to Goliath. He doesn't sort of go right up to him and then start fighting in a you know a more traditional way that two guys would get you know within a couple of sword lengths of each other I guess and and, and go at it. He, he didn't. He didn't do that. He he stayed away from the problem, but close enough where you know God could take could could take care of it. He he didn't get to where the problem could hurt him, where the weapons that the the that the problem had could uh, could uh, could get to him. Um, he tackled it early, and he tackled it from a distance. And I think that's a good lesson for us too, you know, that when we have a an issue, it doesn't even have to be a Goliath-type issue. It can be anything, really. Tackle it early. Pray about it early. Do it quickly. Um, you know, don't don't let Goliath get within three feet of you and then say, oh, what, what can I do now to defeat this giant? You know, d defeat him while he's over there. And don't defeat him while he's, you know, three feet in front in front of you sort of thing. In uh, just a quote here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion or, or agreement has light with, with darkness? We don't want to be entangled with the things of, of, of this world. You know, how can, we, how can we have fellowship with the things of the world? They're, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum to what we want to be uh, involved in. You know, what joining is there between light and darkness? There's nothing. There's either darkness or, or there's light there. Um, let's have a look at a couple of things in the New Testament. We'll just, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Maybe Hebrews chapter 4, I might just skip a little bit. I was going to look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 if you want to write that down for homework, but I, I, uh, I won't. I'll run out of time if I do. So um, Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them, uh, in them that heard it. You know, David could have had the most powerful weapon available, but he had to have faith mixed in with it for it to be uh, effectual. He had to 
put off the world. He had to put that. He had to put Saul's armor off him. He had to unyoke himself, uh, literally, uh, from it, and and walk in faith to allow the Lord there to defeat uh, to defeat that enemy. If you look in verse um, twelve. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents um, of, of the heart. You know, God knows everything about us, um, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're facing. Um, all of all of those things um even what even what we're going to um face but the most important thing even more important than that is that that's where the answer lies that's where the solution is that's where if we have that faith and trust in him that nothing will overcome you nothing will overtake you nothing will will be overbearing um, to you. It says here that uh, the word of God is quick, it's alive. In the Amplified, in that verse 12, it says, the word for the word that God speaks is alive and it's full of power. It's active, operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating to the dividing line of the uh, of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and the purposes of the heart. That word defy there in the Old Testament, it meant to expose. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the word of God can perhaps expose our... Um, weaknesses or whatever you might, might want to say but there's always a way to allow god to get us uh, back on track to realize that that word is alive in our, in our life and we are constantly being examined the bible even says examine yourself um, to see if you be in the faith and uh, the word of god the word of god does that like like nothing else you can be reading something and all of a sudden you'll have some thought that'll that'll come to you wow that that applies to me maybe i should do this that or the other thing whatever it might whatever it might be we know that his word is never going to change we never have a we're never going to have to second guess the lord are we we read about jesus christ no variableness neither shadow um, of turning what he declared yesterday you can you can trust in today and you know there's not a lot of stuff in this world where that is true where you can say um it's not going to change it's going to be exactly the same i can rely upon it i can trust in it it's it's rock solid and uh the world is almost the opposite to that sometimes living in the world can be like being in quicksand <laughs> you sort of you know the the, the more you struggle the, the the deeper you go you know and um the lord's there with his with his rope i uh, grab the rope i'll pull you out you just grab it i'll pull you out kind of thing um let's uh finish in ephesians chapter three Verse 16, Ephesians 3, 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. But Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, 
unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. One of the great lessons that we need to understand is, um, is at the end of verse 20 there. It's the power that works in us, not the power that is us. It's not our strength at all. That's where Israel fell down. And they fell down a lot of times, not just that one time, because they, they just seem to always think we've got to do it. And look how big that problem is. Maybe if we run away, that will be better. And, um, you know, they constantly have those kind of thoughts um, in, in their minds. So it's always the power that works in us. It's the Holy Spirit. What power would we have if we didn't have the Holy Ghost? Where would you be today, do you think, if you hadn't received the Holy Spirit? What would your life be? What would your what would your day to day existence be? Probably, uh, probably not very good. I I suggest. In Romans eight it says, "And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose." According to his purpose, we are called. And uh, there's lots of things like that, you know. Not the power that is us, but the power that is in us. The world might think it's got you beaten, just like Goliath did. He was a winner in his own, in his own mind. He thought the outcome was a foregone conclusion. And he was 100% right. It was a foregone conclusion. Um, he just had the wrong winner. The foregone conclusion was that God was going to win every single battle, every single time. So the world might think it has you beaten. But we've got to remember that us and God are a majority every single time. David could not have lost that battle, not because he picked the best five stones, but because he picked God to be on his side. That's why he won. Had nothing to do with the stones. It wasn't how good his sling was, you know, how good his aim was, but what how good a how good a shot he was. None of that mattered at all. Because God guided the stone. Let God guide your stone. When that Goliath comes, throw the stone by all means. Just let God guide it. And you'll be a winner every time. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. All right.